just because something is entertaining doesn't mean it doesn't it doesn't it isn't educational or enlightening for us. Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I geek out about the stories we are passionate about in all different genres, styles, and formats. And we'll give a few recommendations to you, our listeners. Beware, possible spoilers ahead. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and I started this podcast during the COVID-19 pandemic. As I watched the reaction of my social media circle, I noticed that many people turned to stories for comfort and help in making sense of the craziness going on around them. And as all good stories do, the world got even crazier. But, as Neil Gaiman says, fairy tales are more than true not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Since I believe that stories have the power to show us the way and give us courage to keep going, I wanted to see if that was true for my guests as well. Today, my guest is Alex Felton, and she works at the library at Cochise College, where I teach. And Alex, I think, though, we met when my husband was involved in empty bowls, and you were making bowls for that. Yes, I uh, I had started taking ceramics a few years after I started at the college and knew Virginia, one of the ceramics instructors, real well, and she got me involved with empty bowls. And that's where I met your husband. And then and, you. And I'm sad that they aren't doing empty bowls. This They had to stop doing it at the city studio because something about the financial thing with the, the city. And then Virginia was going to take it over, but COVID hit. So unfortunately... Yeah. Well, they'll start it again. Yeah. Uh, so I enjoy it. I think it's a wonderful community event um, that really brings people together. Plus, it's feeding people. And that's one of the most vital things that we can do is make sure people have food. Yes. Well, and, you know, a lot of community organizations were involved in it. So I'm I'm looking forward to that starting again. Me too. So, so the reason I asked you to be on the show was our fun conversation that we had during the summer when you were helping me figure out all the movies I was going to show in, just, in dramatic structure. Mm-hmm. And you and I just talked and talked and talked about the movies and movies that we loved. And I was wondering, you since you work at the library, you must be a reader as well. So I wanted to know how you got hooked on stories. Yeah, I I, I have been a huge reader all my life. Um, it's odd. And now that I'm a librarian, I don't read as much as I used to, oddly enough. But I have, have been a huge reader all my life. In fact, I think it goes all the way back to before I could even read. My mom read to us. And my dad told us stories about his his life that were fascinating. So those two things combined, I think, really kind of ignited a spark in me of, of oh, there's all these different things that are going on that happened or didn't happen, but could happen. In the yeah. world. And my dad, my dad's stories were all about him being a kid and doing crazy things like hauling his bicycle up onto the roof of their house and riding it over because he was a little daredevil. And then my mom, she mostly read to us. And some of the earliest books I can remember her reading are Beatrice Potter, The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin, and The Tale of Two Bad Mice, which just cracked us up. And then The Chronicles of Narnia, which she read to us as well. And those are the two, I mean, she read to us other stuff, but those are the two sort of book series that I vividly remember. Oh, yeah. Our first house in San Jose, California, and crawling into bed and my mom sitting there reading to me and my sister. Oh, that's so neat. I love those kind of memories. Ah, yeah. Um, She took us to the library just about every week. Oh, wow. Yeah, when we could go. I mean, sometimes I don't know if it was every single week, but it felt like every week to me. Mm -hmm. And she would take us, us down to either our local branch or the main branch in San Jose, and we could pick out books. My mom said you could get 10 books. And I remember a a time, it was probably second or third grade. She's like, you need to make these last, Alex, because we're not going back for a week. Because I would read through my books so fast that by Wednesday or something, I'd be done. 
And then I'd be like, can we go back? (laughs) (laughs) I love it. That's so great. It was wonderful. And and yeah, it's funny. I remember bits and pieces from books. I don't remember necessarily all the titles uh, that I read, but there's these bits and pieces that I remember from books I read when I was that young, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, really had a, an impact on me. And I loved sort of the magical kind of things. You know, I mean, my mom read to us stories about talking animals and countries and, you know, so that definitely was a big part of, of the draw. I read a lot of what you could call fantasy or magical realism, um, science fiction over the years. In fact, the the first movie I can remember going to see in a, in a theater is um, Star Wars, episode four, A New Hope. Yes. And I was like six. And I remember being in the car, driving along. And my mom said, oh, we're going to the movies. And I was like, well, Hope is not that Star Wars movie. <laughs> I remember saying this and then it turned out to be Star Wars. And then we loved it so much. We sat through it twice. So (laughs) it was kind of, that just was the end for me between the the storytelling and the science fiction, wonderful, you know, movie, I was just hooked. And so I read a lot of different things, but definitely there's a a special place in my heart for science fiction and and fantasy. Yes. Those are kind of my go-to genres too. Although I do, when I actually started really reading like voraciously Uh, Mm -hmm. we grew up we moved to lots of small towns that didn't have public libraries they didn't have a town public library Mm, so it was just I know so I mean they were really small towns so the but the scholastic book fair that would be the thing and the school library But when I was in high school, my mom started giving me these romance novels. And I read about 10 of them. And I said, these are all the same. And I'm really bored. Well, about that time, they started doing these high-end miniseries. And I remember one of the first ones was Centennial. Richard Chamberlain was in it. Oh, Chamberlain my mom like, loved that. Yeah. He was like the star of all those. Because I, I own Shogun. I loved it so much with mm-hmm. him in it. Um, but uh, Centennial, and I loved it so much that I went and got the book. And so I read several of James Michener's books until I got to Hawaii. And then it was like the descriptions of the flowers and the descriptions. And I just went, oh, come on, let's get on with the story. (laughs) (laughs) But I read two or three uh, or maybe four of them. Caravans was one. Um, So historical fiction. And then my mom really loves mysteries. So at some point I started reading those too. So I'll kind of go on a jag where I read lots and lots of fantasy or lots and lots of redos of fairy tales or... Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I love those. And then I get kind of tired of that. And so then I'll go read some historical fiction and some mysteries. And sci-fi, I read sci-fi occasionally, but I'm not as hooked on it as I am fantasy and mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. fairy tales. Because I remember dad, I think mom and dad bought us a copy of Grimm's fairy tales. And I read those when I was fairly young. My dad had dyslexia, so he didn't read to us. And my mom worked and she was always Mm -hmm. very tired. And so occasionally she would read to us, but she worked. So we didn't get that, unfortunately. Yeah. My mom ran an in-home daycare. So she was home. um, She was able to have some of that time in the evening. My dad was the, the one who worked outside the home. So he was like your mom came home tired, you know, wanted to watch his program and mm-hmm. just have a nice, quiet household. You know, that it, you said something about, you know, retellings of fairy tales. And it reminded me of there was an anthology series. And I think Terry, is it Terry Windling, Windling uh-huh. had put out that would collect together probably like maybe the 80s, the 90s, I'm thinking, where she would collect short stories from all these different authors that were retellings or, you know, different takes on fairy tales. And I just remember 
just being fascinated because these were, I mean, fairy tales weren't originally children's tales. Right. They were like, a lot of them came from folk tales. They, They were, you know, different. They were for the amusement of, when you read some of the original versions of the fairy tales, it's obvious they are not for kids. I mean, no, they're gruesome. But uh, so some of the anthologies were like Snow White, Blood Red, Black Thorn, White Rose, and they had all kinds of authors that you, you hear like Jane Yolen, Tanith Lee, Neil Gaiman, Charles DeLint, just all these different, really Peter Straub, Rogers Lasney. I mean, just these really amazing authors would come together and, and or submit um, stories. And they were some amazing, sometimes wonderful, sometimes thought-provoking, sometimes disturbing takes on fairy tales. And I plowed through those when I was, probably when I was in college, and was able to get my hands on a lot more books at the college college library. Oh, yeah. Well, when I was going to college, I was doing, well, at first, my first degree is in religious studies, so I was reading theology and stuff like that, philosophy. <laughs> was like well, that was really difficult. <laughs> I'd have to read it two or three <laughs> times before I knew what I was what was going on in the treatise, you know. But when I started doing theater and taking theater classes, well, and I did take as many literature classes as I could because we had this wonderful instructor. Her name was Velma Rouge. I think she was tr- Norwegian or something. She had immigrated from Scandinavia someplace. And oh, she was fantastic. So I took like the religion and literature class and the Shakespeare class from her and the other theater class and literature mm-hmm. from her. And so that was, that was my, when I started doing that, reading plays and stuff, I loved that. Oh, and yeah. watching them in theater history and introduction to theater. And so, yeah, I got away from reading novels and so on when I was going to college but then when Barry and I moved to Portland we I started reading again and I don't even remember all of the but I do remember (laughs) I do remember one one of my birthdays Barry had to go to a conference in California and I was home by myself and I read from is this first time I've ever done this uh the bridges of Madison County I read I started it in the morning and I finished it at night and I'm not a fast reader, but of course, it's not a very long book. But No, no, I, I remember when it came out. I read it like maybe a couple of years after it came out too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's definitely an easy read. It is. And then I, I think I read Dune at that time. Oh, you know, one right of my after favorite books of all time. Yeah, I have never read the whole, and Barry read more of the series than I did. Mm-hmm. And we had this wonderful woman at church. She was friends her, she and her husband, although her husband was dead when Barry and I moved to Portland, but she was friends with my mom and dad. Mm-hmm. She and her husband had been friends with my mom and dad when I was a child. And she loved The Wrinkle in Time. Uh, who's the, Oh, Madeline Lengel. She loved Madeline Lengel. So she gave us all these Madeline Lengel books. I was hooked. <laughs> I loved them all. And then I, I think that's when I started to read The Chronicles of Narnia. I don't I hadn't read them when I was a child. So I read all these young adult fiction books and stuff because of, because of our friend Arden. Yeah. Um, Ring of Endless Light was like, that was the first Madeline Lingle book I read. Oh. Um, my mom, my mom was sort of, when we were young, my mom was sort of a, a, a new Christian and she mm-hmm. was very iffy about anything that had magic to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was okay with C.S. Lewis because he was Christian. Mm-hmm. And, um, but she was a little iffy about some other things. So like Madeline Langall, she was like, I don't know about that. And then of course I read her as an older person, as an older person or, or a teenager, or young adult, whatever. And I'm like, oh, she's written stuff about Christian theology. Mom, mom probably would have been okay with this. Yes. And a lot, yeah. a lot more relaxed since then. But at the time, she was very, um, very concerned. So we didn't read Madeline. I never, I didn't read A Wrinkle in Time until I was an adult. Mm-hmm. Well, and, I think, 
I love A Wrinkle in Time, but I think one of my favorite ones is Many Waters about the twins. Yeah. Going back to the flood. That mm-hmm. one's that one's that one was really cool. I liked all of them. But yeah, so uh thanks to Ardine, I got introduced to to YA. And <laughs> oh. she was, you know, she was like my grandmother's age. But she <laughs> She was such a cool lady. I loved her so much. She had a car that she called the tomato because it was tomato red. <laughs> it was like it looked like tomato soup. <laughs> That's cool. She was a cool lady. Yeah. So I was gonna say to you, you know, I don't know if I said this when we were talking about all the movies that I was gonna show in dramatic structure, but I got hooked on movies, on stories through movies, really, mm-hmm. because my dad was so good at reading body language and facial expressions and stuff. So we would watch when we were younger, we would watch the the wonderful world of Disney or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. And so then my dad would ask us all these questions about, well, what did you think about what you read? And what did you think about these characters and this plot point and that plot point? And so when I got involved in theater, I went, oh, I already know how to analyze plays because I learned it from my dad. (laughs) But that was some of the most fun things when I was, especially when I was like a junior and senior in high school, because I would stay up late and watch a movie on Friday. Friday and Saturday night. And sometimes my dad would come out and watch the movie with me and then we'd talk about it. Oh, nice. So that was kind of like, That's so nice. Little, yeah, this little, my little memory, like your parents reading and talking to you, telling stories was me and my dad watching movies together. And it was so fun. I loved it. And my mom giving me books because she was an avid reader. So she was always up for giving us books at the Scholastic Book Fairs. Mm -hmm. I remember one book I definitely remember reading was when I was 12 or 13. I was the oldest. So I'm 13 years older than my youngest sister and 10 years older than the sister, my other sister. And my brother's two years younger than me. So there was this big gap. Mm -hmm. So I was always the one taking care of the kids. Well, this one year they had this book called Baby Island. I don't even know why I remember the title of it. It's the only one that I remember the title of. And it was these kids that got like shipwrecked somehow and all the adults had died or something. And the oldest girl was like, my age, she was 12 or 13 years old, and she was taking care of all the little, and one of them was a baby, all the children, oh, wow. and until they got rescued. And that book stuck with me <laughs> because, you know, I would come home and I would take over taking care of the, my sisters. See, and I probably would have loved that because it would have been, you know, like shipwrecked on an island and, and what mm-hmm. an adventure kind of thing. That's really, and my, you know, cause my mom ran it in home daycare. We, we were around little kids oh, and now we yeah. stuff a lot too. I mean, we didn't really take care of them. She did, but right. Um, you know, it was, it was, we definitely helped out. Um, yeah. And my brother is eight years younger than me. Um, oh. So definitely he was born. My, my older sister and I did help out with him a lot too. So I, I'm, I'm up with you on that. <laughs> Yeah, that age gap thing. I I can understand that. Like my brother and I, we kind of, like after my sister moved out of the house, he and I kind of banded together a bit. We both love science fiction. Mm -hmm. And so I I was kind of feeling at the point, like it didn't matter what I wanted. Like, you know, my parents weren't going to agree. But if my brother asked, then then it would be something that he, he was more likely to get a yes than I was. So I remember when Star Trek The Next Generation started oh. on TV. I don't know if you ever watched that, but I oh, love Yes. And I said, John and I were talking, my brother John and I were talking, and and I said, oh, I wish we could watch that. And he goes, me too. And I said, well, why don't you ask dad? And he goes, well, I guess I could. So he asks my dad, and my dad's like, sure. <laughs> like, it was probably no big deal. I could have, could have probably asked, and it would have been fine. But you know how kids get ideas in their heads about things? Yeah. I was just kind of in this thought pattern that I wasn't going to get a yes, but my brother would. Yeah. So he and something he and I watched together. And then later he and I would uh, sort of uh, bonded over two things. One, you two. We love the band, you two, both of us. Uh Uh And second, we were sci-fi buddies. So when new movies would come out, we would go see them. In fact, he and I went to see the matrix when it came out and we were both like blown away. And 
that one, uh, pretty much all these films that were sci-fi related, and it's even some that weren't, we were, we always would go and see them together. And so he and I, um, he and I both really, and we talk about it, you know, afterwards. Right. That's the fun part. And that's kind of interesting because I love sci-fi television and movies, but I don't read a lot of it. I don't know why that is. That's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, watching and reading of science fiction these days. mm -hmm. Well, I am old enough that uh, my brother and I loved the original Star Trek. We watched it when it mm-hmm. was first aired in the 60s. And so, yes, when uh, Barry and I were married in Star Trek, The Next Generation came along, we watched that. And then we watched every iteration after that. <laughs> and and now that we are, um, they've started it again, we we didn't have the streaming service that for when Discovery started, but now um, they've started showing it on regular CBS. So we recorded it. And we're gonna we're gonna watch it, and then I want to see Picard because I love Patrick mm. Stewart. And, oh yeah. God, yes, I have to. I haven't watched those yet. But my brother, I talked to my brother, and then I talked to my other my other good friend who's also a Star Trek huge Star Trek fan, mm-hmm. and because my friend enjoyed Discovery way more than Picard and my brother enjoyed Picard more than Discovery. And so now I have to watch both. To and then I can go back and be like, ah, I see what you mean. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What yeah. I love about Picard is, this is just sort of on a side note, is that his dog in the series is a Pipple mix. Mm-hmm. And he's done a lot of work with Foster, he and his wife, Foster Pipples. Mm-hmm. And he's really worked hard to try to change people's ideas about these stereotypes they have about pipples, which are all false. Yes. Um, and my sister does pipple rescue too. And so she has a, she has a pipple mix, um, pipple sharp mix, and he's hilarious, sweetest dog. And it's all about, you know, bad owners make bad dogs. I and know, so I, that's right. he was like insistent, he's going to have a dog and it's going to be the pipple. And you, you know, he's going to be his number one. And I was just, I was really happy about that. And if you want to cut that part out of the, the thing, you can. But I was just thrilled about, about oh, yeah. he was showing because he and his, his wife love love dogs and they foster pit bulls too. Because in England, they're illegal still. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, which is why they don't adopt one. Right. They just foster here in the U.S. when they're here in the U.S. So I do have to watch those two shows still. It's on my I, list. Yeah, me too. Well, Patrick Stewart, almost anything Patrick Stewart does. I. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Yeah. And I think you're I think you're right. I mean, science fiction television has and and movies have been a big part of my life since I was little. Mm-hmm. My mom loved the original Star Trek. Um, and then we watched the Star Wars films and then just anything after that um that we could get our hands on to watch. And um even the cheesy sort of a you know, bunch right in the 80s, teenage, you know, like this last Starfighter and Fly the Navigator and a few ones that are, you know, great, oh. you know, great movie making, but they're they're good. They were fun. Um, yeah, exactly. The idea that they think of what is going to make a better future too. And I think that's because oh. there's still going to be problems no matter what, but there's what they focus on, like, you know, when you erase these, these problems, what, is, what else is there? So if we don't have to worry about, making sure our families are fed and clothed and have some place to live. What can we focus on? What can we achieve? Right. And really love that vision. Yeah. yeah. So when we were talking about movies, you said that you absolutely mm-hmm. love now Voyager. And I was wondering if there were any other classic movies that you really love. <laughs> yes. So my two, I've got like three favorites. Um, and then I've got a bunch of other ones because classic movies, my mom watched them. Um, and of course, even those were classic for her because um, she was a teenager in the 60s, uh, late 50s, early 60s. And so, but so favorite drama, classic drama, best years of our lives. Oh, I love that one too. And down. I love that film so much. And I think it is still so relevant today mm-hmm. because we have people coming back from the military who've been fighting, who've been traumatized, who have had, and there's stuff in that film. There's people who have lost, there was the, the one young man who lost both his hands mm-hmm. and they hired an actual veteran, mm-hmm. lost his hands in World War II. 
Yeah, I love that. Uh, and then the one, the one man coming back and trying to resettle into his job with his family. Um, and then the other young, the, the middle, I don't know, maybe it's like 30. And he comes back and, the, and his wife is kind of like not interested. She liked being the wife of a war hero, but she didn't really like being his wife. And she but also, wanted him to make a lot of money. Exactly. And wear his uniform all the time. And he is, it's obvious when you see that the, the nightmares and then the, the just, it's, it's PTSD right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Having flashbacks and he's um, having issues with, um, you know, loud noises or whatever. And I think that there, it's just still so, I mean, there's a reason it won an Oscar. Yeah. Um, and won and, more than one Oscar, I think. Yeah. It was it's phenomenal. I love that film so much. Yeah. Um, and all the actors are so good. I just love yes. all of them. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, me too. Mm-hmm. Um, so second, oh, comedy would be Philadelphia Story. Oh. <laughs> which is just, it's just classic, you know? I mean, Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart. And, I know. Yeah, and Catherine Hepburn. I mean, it's just, it's quick-witted. And then there's the weird little sister. I just loved her. I mean, she's, she comes into the house on point in her ballet shoes and asks things in French and then leaves. I mean, <laughs> just hilarious. And then, she's, and then she plays that, like, drinking song kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Lydia, oh, Lydia, oh, do you know Lydia? <laughs> Lydia, the Taha to lady. Oh, my gosh, yes. Such a good, so good. Um, and then sort of mystery, sort of noir, I, I would, Laura. Have you seen Laura? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I love well, that. Dana Andrews so, there, that he, yes. he is in Huge that crush. and in, yes, I love Best him. Years of Our Lives. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of films I love, but those, those sit comfortably at my top three. And just, I don't even know why. I don't remember the first time I saw them. Probably sometime when I was a kid. And then later watched them, rented them from Blockbuster or whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's just something about each of them. And I think what's so interesting about Laura is the storytelling. Because the narrator is, I can't remember his name right now, but he's a, he's a journalist. And he was friends with Laura. And so he's narrating. Yeah. It's, Clint it's Webb's just character. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, he's so good in that. And it's just, plus a very young Vincent Price playing a playboy. Yeah. Not something you see all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're used to him in like House of Blood or something. I know. Well, and the woman that uh, plays Jean Tierney's aunt, who is the the scary, scary woman in Rebecca. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I've seen that, but it's been a long time. Oh, yeah. She plays Mrs. Danvers in Rebecca, and she's so scary in that. Oh, wow. Totally different in Laura. I'll have to, I'll have to watch that again. Yeah, she's kind of flittery and mm-hmm. and self-absorbed, and, mm-hmm. you know, she tries to be nice, but she's totally in love with Vincent Bryce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I love when she says to Laura, I can afford him. Laura says, did you kill the model that everybody thought was Laura. Yeah. And she said, no, <laughs> no dear, but I could have. You know? <laughs> the way she says yeah. it is so great. Yeah. She just owns it. Like she's, she knows what she is and who she oh, yeah. is, how she acts. And she's like, fine, this is the way it is. And yeah. she cares about her, her niece, but you know, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then Alfred Hitchcock, always a huge fan of, of a lot of his, his Mm -hmm. films. Though I didn't see Psycho for a really long time because just the thought of it scared the heck out of me. It is Um, pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, there's some there, you know, um, Ingrid Bergman and um, Gregory Peck. Oh, Gregory Peck is my all time favorite. (laughs) Where he's an insomniac and I can't remember. I can't remember. Spellbound. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And with the Salvador Dali dream sequence. Oh, that's so cool. Literally, it was Salvador Dali who who, who was the designer for that. And I was like, geez, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They had a good chemistry. Plus, Mm -hmm. he's so dishy. I just could watch him anytime. Oh, I just love him. Uh, I'm collecting all of his movies because there's there are a couple where he plays a bad guy that I can't watch him. But everything Boys from, else. Boys from Brazil where he's like Mangala or something. Right. And then there's another one called, oh, he, Jennifer 
Jennifer Jones is in it and Joseph Cotton and it's a Western. Duel in the Sun. I Sun-Dust. love Joseph Cotton too. Okay, yeah. Duel in the Sun. I haven't seen that. I'm not a big yeah. Western fan and I think that's why. I could not watch it because they should, in my opinion, Joseph Cotton should have been the bad brother. They're brothers. Yeah. And Gregory Peck should have been the good brother. So I don't watch that one. Yeah, Joseph Cotton was a good bad guy. Well, he was a good good guy too because I love him in Gaslight. Oh, I haven't seen that. Oh. Gaslight with English. Oh, yeah. I know, I know about it, but I can't believe I'd seen it. I have to go. I have to go watch that one. Oh yeah, it's really good. Um, and, but I was and, thinking about him in um, Shadow of a Doubt. Oh right. Oh yes. So good in that. He is good in that. Yeah. It's interesting when 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 actors play against type. Like um, Richard Widmark played a lot of bad guys, and but there's a film where he's um, called My Pal Gus, mm-hmm. um, which if you've never seen. Um, it's hard to get a hold. I have a copy of it, but it's hard to get a hold of where he plays a single father of a little boy named Gus. And he's, he's, he's struggling with being a father. And what he does is he throws money at the problem. And it's sort of how he gets, realizes how to be a real father. And it's really, it's cute. Um, and it's, it's pretty well made, I think. But he's just this, I mean, he's kind of a jerk at first, but then, you know, he kind of realizes how much he really loves his son and how to be a better father. And it's, it's like completely against type, you know, him being like this crazy bad guy. Well, I've seen him a lot and he does play good, good guys too, because I mm-hmm. love him in Cold Sassy Tree. Oh, I haven't seen that. He was quite old when he I made I love that him. book. Oh, yeah. And Faye Dunaway plays the um, milliner who mm-hmm. he marries and Neil Patrick Harris, Harris plays his grandson. Oh, it was a made cool. for TV movie. And oh man, he was in his 70s, late 70s, maybe early 80s. Mm-hmm. And I, I said to my sister, I don't care. He's still sexy. <laughs> He's still so sexy. Because I really like Richard Woodmark too. And there, uh, there are other movies. Like there's one where there's a pandemic start, could possibly start. And he's try- He's a doctor. He's a military doctor. Mm-hmm. And he's trying to find the first people who had the disease so that they can try to, you know, go find all the people that they exposed to. Right. Like, contain it. I can't mm-hmm. remember the name of that one. Prescient. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I cannot remember the name of that one, but he's really good in that. I've seen him in some Westerns where he plays good guys mm-hmm. too. So I think it's, it's been a while. I haven't watched a lot of classic movies. Like I used to go through spates, like you were saying with books. I did the same thing with books where I would watch like a whole bunch of classic films films and I watched a ton and then I kind of would watch a whole bunch of French films and then Italian and then I would watch maybe you know this genre or that and I would just go because I would go to Blockbuster every week and rent two or three movies mm-hmm. in the weekend and then return them mm-hmm. um I wasn't a party person <laughs> so I had a lot of time to watch films that's right um, I'm not yeah. a party person either yeah it's interesting one of my favorites is um, My Man Godfrey, which I'm not the hugest fan of screwball comedy, which is odd because one of my, you know, a couple of my favorites. I could go under, under that sort of heading, but there's just something about about that. And plus it's, um, it's kind of got a, some interesting social commentary too mm-hmm. because with the homeless men and and the fact that these rich people are running a scavenger hunt and one of their scavenger hunt items is a forgotten man. Right. A homeless man that they have to bring. Yes. Yeah. And it's so, it just, it just shows this complete lack of understanding and empathy of this class of people. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and how can you go wrong with Carol Lombard and William Powell? I mean, right. Right. That's so great. And she's hilarious. She is a kook. I just, I do love her in that. I just, she's so funny in that. Yes. Um, but she did some really interesting, serious roles, too. There's one that she does with Cary Grant. It's called In Name Only. And he mm-hmm. is the son of this fairly wealthy man played by Charles Coburn. And he's married to this woman who is really... Oh, she just married him for his money. She doesn't love him. Mm-hmm. And he's sick at heart about it. And when he's on vacation by himself, he meets Carol Lombard and her daughter. I think she's a widow. Her sister's divorced. That's right. She's a widow and her sister's divorced. And so her sister lives with them. 
and takes helps take care of the daughter. And she's like an illustrator or a fashion designer or something Mm -hmm. and something in the arts and they fall in love. Well, his wife, of course, is never going to divorce him because she wants the money. And so it's um, near the end of the year and he is so depressed that he goes to this hotel. He gets totally drunk, opens up this window and it's freezing cold and he gets pneumonia. And so they call Carol Lombard because his he has her address in, and phone number in his wallet or something. And mm-hmm. so she comes and tries to take care of him. But finally, they have to call the doctor and send him to the hospital because he has pneumonia. Well, his wife and father and mother show up and at one point Kay Francis plays his wife oh. <laughs> so good and she's talking to Carol Lombard and doesn't realize that his parents are standing behind her and Carol Lombard says he's he's going to die you need to take care of him or something or maybe she's asking him to asking her to give him a divorce. And she says, no, because his father at some point will die and he will get all the money. And the father and the mother hear this, of course. And then they realize right. that they have been wrong about their son not loving this woman because she doesn't love right. him but herself. It's just such a great movie. I, I, oh, I've never seen it. I, I, it doesn't even sound familiar, oddly. I have to, I'll have yeah. to death for that one. I was trying to get another movie and I accidentally got that one. Mm-hmm. I, maybe I, I, actually, I think I was buying it for my sister for Christmas and I accidentally bought it for myself and then I had to buy <laughs> another copy for my sister. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cary Grant and, and Gregory Peck, those are my two favorite guys. Oh, I love, I look, um, I love them both. Yeah. Um, two, Cary Grant was one of the first ones that I just adored. And my mom, I can remember like indiscreet would come on indiscreet. We just uh, watched that last night. Yeah. And, and I think that's the one I'm thinking of with Claude Rains and she's like a spy. Is that, or is that a different one? Oh, that's notorious. Notorious. Well, both of them yes. are. Yeah. Notorious is the one I'm thinking of. Yes. Um, and just so amazing. And I don't know the one who plays Cla- Claude Rains' mother, but she's just so good at being awful. You know, like, I think that was the only movie she ever made. Really? Yes. I think she was a theater actress okay. in Europe, but she's so good. It was like, oh, I wish she would have made more movies because she's really fantastic in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. North by Northwest. Was the oh. I watched a lot when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. That's a good one too. Yeah. So, so yeah. good. Well, um, yeah, that's sort of, sort of where it started for me with, for, for Cary Grant. And I don't yeah. remember the first film I saw with Gregory Peck. Um, I do. But it might have been spellbound, but I don't know. Well, uh, when I was a child, my mom and dad would go to the drive in movies and they had a station wagon, and my brother and I would sleep in the back. <laughs> So they went to see, I did not, I could not figure out what this movie was for years and years and years until I started watching Turner Classic Movies. But I had this vision of this scene with Gregory Peck and David Niven and some other people wearing German uniforms. And they had discovered that this woman was a spy and they were discussing who was going to kill her because she had been giving information to the Germans about their mission. And Irene Pappas kills her. And and so I had this vision of this scene in my head for years and years. And finally, one day I saw The Guns of Navarone on Turner Classic Movies. And there was that scene. And I went, oh, that's what my parents were watching when I woke up and saw that scene. <laughs> I haven't seen that. I, I mean, I know about that movie, but I haven't seen it. Oh, I know. Tw- it was probably 12 o'clock high. Oh, that's a good one, too. I think that one's got Gregor. Is that Gregor? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, because my dad loved, he was very, very into World War II aircraft, airplanes mm-hmm. in general. But World War II aircraft were, were a hobby of his. And uh, and the war in general, I mean, World War II in general, he had a big interest in. And I remember any time 12 O'Clock High came on, he would watch it. And so I'm sure that's the first time, that's the first movie I probably saw Greg Peck in. Yeah. 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 But I'll have to check out Guns of Everyone because I have not seen that one. Yeah. It's really <laughs> an anti-war movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a good movie. 
that's really good. And Irene Pappas, oh my gosh, she's so fantastic. I love her too. I, there are so many good actors and actresses out there. I can never say this is my one and all time favorite. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, there's there's always those ones where you're like, I'll watch anything with that person in it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's there are so many amazing actors, um, and and to see them in these different roles especially the ones where you know one time they're playing this creepy guy one time or, or girl one time playing um you know a socialite one time they're playing like a you know a, a waitress or whatever you know a mom whose kid is sick or something you know and you just all these different roles and then and how they just mold themselves into these people it's I have a lot of respect for actors uh and and the way that they the way they tell stories you know, somebody else writes it, but they're telling the story mm-hmm. yeah. really, through, through their acting. Yeah. And the thing that we talk about in acting class is, you know, you don't get a lot of information. You have every line means something, but you could change the way the emphasis of the character is just by the way you say the line. So you have to kind of make some of it up. You have to explore. You have to, well, if I say it this way, what's that going to make me feel? How's that? What kind of reaction am I going to get from the other actor (laughs) if I say it that way? You know, so it's all this exploration process. That's what the rehearsal process is all about. I kind of miss acting a little bit. I'm too old for it now. (laughs) It takes a lot of energy. (laughs) Well, but yes, that's true. But, you know, my mom, my mom always loved movies and TV and, and reading and she loved musicals. Oh. In fact, a lot of what we listened to on the stereo at home were the Beatles, mm-hmm. folk music, like 60s, 60s mm-hmm. folk music and musical soundtracks. Oh, yeah. Because what my mom had, she loved those. Mm-hmm. And Herb Alpert, Herb Alpert. <gasps> oh, right, yes. Joanna oh. Brass, yes. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, she, after she retired, um, and actually, yeah, she was in her 60s, I guess. She um, started auditioning and started being in, in plays and mu- musicals mostly at the local theater, the Imagination Theater in Placerville, California. She was just, she wanted to do it. And she did it for probably 10 years. And then she has it recently, but she was in a bunch of different ones. Um, she was in um, Annie, Music Man, I think, Blame is Rob. How they did an Alice in Wonderland where she was Tweedledum. Oh, wow. How funny. Um, so funny. She and her her co-star were great together uh, as the Tweedledee character. And, oh, Big River. Oh, and yeah, and then there's another one that I can't think of right now, but she just loved it. And she was not, she was like, I'm just going to do it because I wanted to do this all my life and I'm going to do it. And so she did That's and um, really loved it. Yeah. I did it when I was young and now I'm doing this when I'm old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, but you know, if I was going to do it for a career, I decided I just couldn't do that because I would never see Barry as it was. Oh, being yeah, my professional. Career, yeah. I hardly ever saw him. He'd come home, we'd have maybe 45 minutes to eat dinner together, and then I'd be off to rehearsal and I'd get home at 11 or 11 30 and he'd be oh. asleep. And then he'd wake up and leave at seven and kiss me goodbye. And you know, it was oh. like, I, that's I, hard. Yeah. And I miss lots of like family weddings and other things. And I said, you know, I think I just don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So getting to teach theater was fun because Mm -hmm. it was still my connection, but I didn't have to be there all the time. It was only when I was directing a play once a summer. The Twelfth Night production was so much fun. I enjoyed that a lot. Yes. It's one of my favorite uh, Shakespeare plays, but it was... It was just you guys, uh, the way you, the way that you all staged it and the casting and the acting was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Dave is so talented. He's really talented. So, and I, he helped me with measure for measure too. So. Yeah. um, Sadly, I missed that one. Well, we only did a couple of performances and I should have done more. I should have done two Mm -hmm. weekends for performances, Mm -hmm. but. Well, I think that was the year I had Valley Fever. So I was much of anything oh no yeah. <laughs> oh dear that's sort of my swan song because dave now is getting his master's and he'll probably take over for me when he finishes and i can do this and write my blog and my books 
this has been so much fun. And I was wondering if you had anything else you wanted to say. Um, I I was totally, it was lots of fun. I really, I really have enjoyed it. it I, I've forgotten how much fun it is to talk to somebody else about books and movies and stories and how much I, I enjoy the storytelling. I think that just to, just the last thing I'd like to say is I think it's really important that stories are much more important than we think think they are. And telling your kids stories and reading to your children or or having encouraging them to read is way more important than we realize. For one thing, they have shown that children who are read to and or read tend to develop empathy at a higher rate than kids who don't read. And that reading fiction can help develop interpersonal skills can help you better understand other human beings. And that there have actually been studies that show that. And so when people tell people, why are you just reading a book? Go do something productive. Well, yeah, I'm doing something productive. Mm -hmm. Um, I am, I'm training my brain to understand people better. Yeah. And I think that's, that's something that people need to realize that we connect through stories. Um, We connect with the people who are telling them especially if it's someone like our parent or a, or a relative or a brother or sister reading to us or telling us a story, but also just reading ourselves and, and learning about different people. It gives us a, a, a bigger view into the world. And I, I think it's vital that we get that. Yeah. And part of the thing that I love about reading is I get to live another person's life that I probably never really would ever <laughs> live. One of the series that I absolutely love, and I'm she just published her seventh book, um, is The Circle of Caridwin. And it takes place in the 800s in England. The, all the history around that. I, you know, I always had this terrible image of the Middle Ages, but I would never have been able to, of course, live then. That's one of the things I like about historical fiction is another one of my favorites is Ellis Peters, the Cad File series that takes place in the 1100s. And his herbology, all of the things that he grows to help heal people. I mean, (laughs) yeah, I don't want to live any time before antibiotics. Yeah. But it's very interesting to learn about how people lived at those. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, or in different parts of the world too. Yes. That's that's another thing that's so cool is being immersed in another part of the world, or even a part of the world that is in our country. Like when I read The Water Dancer by Tanahasi Coates. Oh, Tanahasi Coates. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's such a great book. And then The Hate You Give. I mean, you know, those mm-hmm. are cultures I'm, that I don't know anything about really. But oh man, such. Yeah. great books so. well right and, and also that gives you um a sense of especially books like those where this is the united states mm-hmm. and this is not the united states we're used to mm-hmm. you know being white middle class people right. who live in and, and academics and we did we live it's a very it's a different culture than people who live in other economic statuses or or who are black or or brown and who are living a very different reality. Yeah. And I think it's so vital for us to know. Like I I mean, prior to several years ago, seven or eight years, I didn't realize I, mean, I knew racism was still an issue, but I didn't know it was that big of an issue. I did not have the full picture right. and understanding. And of course I had the luxury of not paying attention. Right. Like I was trying not to, you know, be aware, but not knowing, I had the luxury of not knowing and it would impact me personally. And then learning more about, about sociology and society and the way that people are treated, it just... It was such an eye opener. And so books definitely, I feel like it's like, why wasn't I reading more, more stuff? I know. (laughs) So I'm sort of on a, I want to read more things from around the world, not just, not just white people (laughs) books. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) definitely. I think that's a really valuable thing. Plus, you know, it it can be just because something is entertaining doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't educational or enlightening for us. Right. And I think that, when I was a kid, there was a real sort of attitude amongst a certain subset of the, of the of society that was like, well, if it's fun, it can't be edifying. Right. And that's just super wrong. Oh, yeah, really? I think so, too. I think so, too. Because you learn, I mean, if the movie makers or the author or who the playwright or 
is sometimes even visual art does this, is if they bring you into their world, then you learn something. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you talking to me. Well, thank you, Cinda. I had a lot of fun. I really enjoyed, like I said, talking about books and stories and made me remember how much I love it. I feel like I don't have time to do things. I need to go and take time or make time spend with stories. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. You'll find the show notes for this episode at my website, Sage Woman Chronicles at sagewoman.life. You can leave a comment there. And remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.